Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this MDA engaged community webinar on polymyositis and dermatomyositis. My name is Michelle Barrios and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA. We are thrilled to have you join us today for this important and educational webinar. The webinar today is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series, which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual education events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing to ensure that those who are not able to join us live today are able to access this information. Please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. Please be sure to utilize the Q&A window to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of webinar icons will appear. Click on the Q&A bubble to open the window and enter your question. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to chat in your questions. As questions come up along the webinar, please feel free to send those in. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you to our speaker, whom you will meet shortly. I would also like to thank our event supporter, Kizar Life Sciences. We would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support, so thank you very much. Let's review the objectives for today's webinar. Attendees will hear a brief overview of polymyositis and dermatomyositis, review best practices in clinical care for individuals with polymyositis and dermatomyositis, and discuss current research and clinical trials. I would now like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Namita Goyal is an Associate Professor of Neurology at University of California, Irvine, and specializes in neuromuscular medicine. She serves as the Director of the ALS Clinic, Director of the Neuromuscular Medicine Fellowship Program, and Director of the Neurology Clinical Trial Unit at UC Irvine. Dr. Goyal has authored several neuromuscular articles and has given many national talks on neuromuscular diseases. In addition to evaluating and treating patients, she is a lead side investigator in several clinical trials involving neuromuscular diseases with a special focus on ALS and myositis. And with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Dr. Goyal. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Michelle, for this, that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the MDA for hosting uh, such an important topic. Um, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen properly. So, um, Michelle, can I just ask you if you can see my screen properly? Yes, I can see it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and uh, hello to everyone out there. Thank you for joining me virtually. Um, as I mentioned, I am a neurologist and neuromuscular specialist, and I have a special passion in myositis, and I hope to share with you some of the insights that I've learned over the years. Uh, I am a medical advisor on the board for the Myositis Association, and as Michelle noted, uh, mentioned, I do several clinical trials in myositis and neuromuscular diseases because I really believe we need better therapies out there for our patients. Um, and really over the 15, 16 years I've been in clinical practice, I've encountered several myositis patients um, that have had a difficult journey either in their diagnosis and or their management. And I've really taken up upon myself uh, to spend some time educating our myositis community and doing better for our patients. And so I hope in the next hour to really 
share with you some of the insights that we've learned about myositis, how we now talk about not only a patient with myositis as an umbrella term, but defining which type of myositis they may have. Um, traditionally, muscle biopsy and electrical studies have been used to diagnose patients, but there have been advancements in diagnosis, and I'll talk about the blood tests that can be done with myositis antibodies and even muscle imaging. We'll talk about the current treatments that are out there as well as new therapies that are on the horizon um, for all the myositis, including inclusion body myositis, which we'll discuss at the end. Um, so as all of you know, myositis is characterized by patients that have muscle weakness and inflammation that typically affects their shoulder girdle muscles and their hip girdle muscles. And other systems can be involved in some types of the myositis. So initially when myositis was described, it was actually described as polymyositis. And I now think of polymyositis as almost an umbrella term with all the different subtypes described underneath it, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. And that's really been defined because over the years, we've had a greater understanding of what muscle biopsies show, what muscle autoantibodies show in the blood. Um, and why it's important is because we now st are starting to believe that different subtypes may have different responses to therapies, as well as have different clinical characteristics. So um, this is just a diagram showing you that initially, it was back in 1887 where polymyositis was described as the one myositis. And all the myositis sort of fell underneath that term. It was about four years later where it was recognized that patients with a skin rash and muscle weakness should be subclassified as dermatomyositis and it broke off from polymyositis. And then it took almost nearly a hundred years uh, to further define and realize that patients with inclusion body myositis clinically looked a little bit different. And again, polymyositis was subdivided. And like this, over the years, through diagnostic and advancements, uh, other subtypes have been defined. And so, um, as I mentioned, what was initially described as polymyositis now has really been broken up into dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis, necrotizing myopathy, antisynthetase syndrome, overlap myositis, and polymyositis has become a smaller entity of all of these just because we have better tools to now define them. And I'll show you why and how. Um, and so clinically, many of these myositis, dermato, antisynthetase, necrotizing myopathy, polymyositis, actually all look very similar with proximal muscle weakness affecting the shoulder girdles and hip girdle muscles. But it was when they started doing muscle biopsies, they realized that they actually have different features in their muscle biopsy and maybe the causes or the triggers for these conditions may be different. This now fast forward into 2020 has become important because we're now starting to think about maybe we should actually be treating these differently. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the hour. This is very different from inclusion body myositis where they realize that clinically these patients do look different. Oftentimes it affects patients over the age of 45 and um, these patients will often have, instead of shoulder girdle muscle weakness, the most prominent weakness in the fingers, as well as in the quadriceps. Another unusual feature over the other myositis is that many of these patients will have muscle atrophy or muscle wasting. Um, that slowly progresses over a long period of time and later stages of the disease in inclusion body myositis 
can be characterized with significant difficulties in walking, in swallowing, and a poorer quality of life. Um, it's interesting because when you see all of these conditions, all of these subtypes across the board, clinically, and the first table, what you'll notice is in blue is that all of them can look the same. They all oftentimes start with thigh leg muscle weakness. And so we've relied on muscle biopsies, uh, which is the histologic hallmarks on the second row in red to help distinguish the different subtypes. Uh, this becomes especially important when dealing with inclusion body myositis, where many patients, of up to 30 to 40 percent of inclusion body myositis patients, are actually initially diagnosed as polymyositis. And then they're placed on long years of treatment before they realize there's no response to therapies. Um, and so it really becomes important to get to the diagnosis fast and avoid unnecessary treatment, especially in patients with inclusion body myositis. And um, the challenge has been is that we used to use muscle biopsies as the sole way of distinguishing between these patients. But um, unfortunately, the muscle biopsy features are not always present. And so more recently, especially in the last five to 10 years, we've been using blood tests, the muscle autoantibodies to help distinguish these features. And so there's actually been newer proposals um, suggesting that we should have a new classification just based on clinical features and the myositis autoantibodies. So, um, by no means is this meant to be memorized, but I do want you to be familiar with the myositis autoantibodies that are out there because they're an easy blood test and much less invasive than a muscle biopsy. So here you have the different subtypes that have been now described over and over again in more recent years. And in white, you see the autoantibodies that are specifically associated with the different subtypes. So why is this important? Why can't we just call this all a myositis? Uh, well, what we've realized is some of these subtypes have different characteristics, different um, types of systems that may be affected. For instance, in antisynthetase syndrome, you may see more lung involvement. And so these patients should be managed in an appropriate way versus a necrotizing myopathy or inclusion body myositis, where you typically won't see a rash or lung involvement, and they should be managed accordingly. And so this table almost just summarizes what I'm gonna show you in the slides to come, how there are now even distinct clinical features that are associated with the different autoantibodies, that us myositis specialists have learned and recognized and have used to help manage our patients. And so I'm gonna uh, just take you through a few of these autoantibodies. Uh, in dermatomyositis specifically, there are now five autoantibodies that are recognized. And some of these autoantibodies in blue have specific clinical characteristics that we automatically start screening for. Uh, for instance, TIF1 gamma and NXP2 are autoantibodies that when found in dermatomyositis show a very high risk for cancer. Not always, but uh, cancer risk is seen in these autoantibodies. And so if I see a patient with the TIF1 autoantibody and dermatomyositis, in particular, I know to screen them for cancer up to three to five years from the time their symptoms presented. Um, I typically will do annual screening with CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, a mammogram, and there's been several times where I've detected the cancer um, and their primary physician had not uh, because I knew to 
do a vigilance screen based on this autoantibody. There's other features that are described, for instance, an NXP2 calcinosis can be present in dermatomyositis. And then MDA5 has an unusual feature where these patients can have a very aggressive lung disease in addition to the skin involvement uh, and even severe ulcerations. And so we know now to treat these patients very aggressively up front to try to prevent some of the secondary issues from developing. Another classification and subtype is the antisynthetase syndrome. These patients have characteristic features of not only myositis, but they can also have lung disease, joint disease, and some patients may have a skin rash. There are now eight autoantibodies that can be associated with antisynthetase syndrome. And so if I see a patient with myositis and I send the blood test, the panel, it's called the myositis antibody panel, and for instance, Joe one antibody come up as positive, I know to screen this patient for lung disease because there is a high association of lung disease that can be present. And so I'll typically do a CAT scan of the chest to look for lung disease or um, have them go to, for pulmonary function tests to see if their breathing tests are normal or not. Um, there are also a panel of autoantibodies. These are myositis associated antibodies that are more nonspecific and that can be seen in other rheumatologic or connective tissue diseases. And um, when I find these, I know that a myositis may be present, but I also look for other rheumatologic or lung or swallowing conditions that can be affiliated. Now, the necrotizing myopathy has two autoantibodies that are associated. One is SRP and the other one is HMGCR. Both of these antibodies can be associated with aggressive muscle weakness. Muscle enzyme levels can be sometimes in the thousands to 10,000s. And I know to be very aggressive with treating them uh, because they may have severe muscle weakness at the onset. In fact, HMGCR antibody was initially described in patients that uh, had cholesterol medications. It's not always the case. Um, they may even have it if they've never been on a cholesterol medication, but I know to stop the cholesterol medication in these patients and treat them with IVIG or aggressive immunotherapy if they have severe weakness. And then the last subtype is inclusion body myositis. There is now one autoantibody identified, NT5C1A. It is present in about 40 to 60% of patients. And so we became very curious why some inclusion body myositis patients had the autoantibody and why others did not. And so we did a small study here at UC Irvine of 25 patients and we found that patients with this autoantibody and inclusion body myositis may have more uh, motor difficulties, gait difficulties, swallowing difficulty, and respiratory involvement. Subsequently, the European group has done a larger study and found similar findings. And so we're keeping an eye out um, if this holds true or not. I'm going to briefly sh shift gears and talk about muscle MRI. This is a tool that is newer and certainly not used in all clinics, but some of our clinics, um, certainly clinics that are specializing in myositis, are using it as a adjunct tool to help us give us insight into myositis. And so we're really using it to help us maybe guide muscle biopsies, pick which muscle may be more affected um, and give us a higher yield in the muscle biopsy. Uh, we're looking at it to look at disease severity and even treatment response 
to monitor how well they're responding to immunosuppressive therapy. And so um, since 2004, it has been used as a tool, as a criteria to help diagnose myositis. And so I briefly just wanted to show you what it looks like. Well, this is normal muscle. And what you see on the left is muscle MRIs, different sequences of the arm. And on the right, cross-sectional of the thigh. And you can see normal healthy muscle looks grayed out, slightly blackish gray, very healthy looking. This is in contrast to myositis patients where you can see uh, these are MRIs of the thigh. And what you can see on the left in a certain sequence called T1, in the posterior compartment of the thigh, uh, it's all whited out. The healthy muscle has been replaced by fat. Uh, and on the right, you can see on a different sequence called the STIR images, uh, you can see that the muscle is lighting up bright white implying that there is edema in the muscle. Now, edema in the muscle in myositis can represent ongoing inflammation, which tells me that these patients may be responsive to steroids or other immune therapies. Uh, but when I see a lot of fat or muscle at, uh, atrophy, um, I know on muscle MRI that this may represent uh, muscle damage and these patients may not be responsive to treatment. Um, and so we're now starting to see that different subtypes of myositis even have different patterns on muscle MRI. And so what you can see here, these are different subtypes that you see on the left, necrotizing myopathy, inclusion body myositis, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and different patterns that we're now starting to recognize. And this uh, has even helped me in diagnosing a patient or managing how well they may respond to treatment. So for instance, the second row you can see here um, is inclusion body myositis. And these are muscle MRIs of the thigh where you can see significant muscle atrophy and fatty replacement and very little edema in the muscle. We'll jump down to dermatomyositis where in contrast, you barely see any atrophy or fatty replacement, but you can see a lot more edema, suggesting to me that these patients may be more amenable to treatment in contrast to IBM where I see a lot more muscle damage uh, and very little edema. So um, why do we care? Why do we do all of this? Because we're now starting to understand uh, that these patients may have different responses to treatment. And first what I'm gonna do is talk about the treatment in dermatomyositis, antisynthetase syndrome, polymyositis, and necrotizing myopathy. And then in the end, we'll talk about inclusion body myositis because we've learned that these patients unfortunately don't respond well to immune therapies. But when we talk about dermatomyositis, antisynthetase, polymyositis, and necrotizing myopathy, we overall approach therapies similarly. Um, in general, we do believe that patients respond well to therapy. And unfortunately, there isn't a single way that's correct in uh, approaching their treatment, but most of us as experts agree that the first-line therapy are steroids. And um, a lot of times, we, the second-line agents that we use are methotrexate, azathioprine, or mycophenolate mofetil. We've also seen that IVIG has been quite an effective therapy, especially in dermatomyositis and necrotizing myopathy. And uh, patients that have a more severe disease, we often think about rituximab. Um, and there's a subtype, SRP myopathies, where we've noticed that they tend to respond well 
to rituximab. And so this is where understanding your subtype becomes important because we are starting to see that certain subtypes may respond well to IVIG or rituximab over these other therapies. And so I tend to use IVIG or rituximab faster when I know a patient may have a responsive subtype. Um, and so I wanted to walk you through the algorithm that I have in treating myositis. These are with sort of the current therapies and what I in particular do for patients with mild weakness. Um, and if patients just have very little mild subtle weakness, um, I often start with prednisone or steroids at doses oftentimes of 20 to 40 milligrams. Um, and I wait sometimes one to two months before I check in to see if there is a treatment response because I know muscle disease does take some time to remodel the muscle. And if there is improvement or stabilization in strength, um, I often will wait a few months before I start tapering prednisone. And I taper prednisone very slowly by 20% even every two to three months uh, before I do a rapid taper and get them off <coughs> other um, the medication because I know that patients tend to do better if they're on a lower dose of prednisone, but for quite some time. Uh, but if patients have moderate to severe disease, these are patients that really have trouble doing their daily activities, that have a burden uh, with muscle weakness, that have difficulty raising their arms above their head, climbing stairs. I often will use multiple agents, prednisone, and I often will add methotrexate or azathioprine early on in their condition. And if patients even present with severe weakness, I'm talking about patients that are wheelchair dependent or truly have difficulty uh, walking, doing daily activities, I oftentimes will add on IVIG uh, very early on to these medications. And again, I'm looking for a treatment response that may take one to two months, but I'm trying to see any signal of improvement. Uh, before I start considering other agents. But if there aren't uh, treatment responses to these standard medications, I will often turn to mycophenolate, cyclosporin, or tetracrolimus. And if someone has very severe disease, I think about using rituximab or IV solumedrol in patients. Um, again, looking in within one to two months if there is treatment responses, maybe not back to normal, but certainly a slope of improvement is a positive encouraging sign. But if I don't see that, this is when I start thinking about combining agents or even more importantly, moving to newer agents uh, that are in clinical trials because I know there may be better agents out there for patients with refractory conditions. Refractory meaning um, that they're not responding to the standard agents that we have out there. And so th this is a complex diagram just showing you how complex the causes of myositis may be. And there's not just one pathway that may be triggering the immune system, but there actually may be several pathways that are a cascade that affect or attack the muscle and trigger the immune system. And so what's really interesting is nowadays, there's development of what we call biologic agents. Uh, we believe we can do better and that we shouldn't just be suppressing the whole uh, immune system, but maybe we can now develop um, medications uh, that are out there that are selectively targeting certain pathways in the immune system that we think specifically may be affected uh, in certain conditions. And so you can see here what I've circled are some of the newer drugs that are 
in clinical trial or have recently been in trial that are in particular uh, targeting certain pathways that may be affecting even a certain subtype of myositis. Uh, it's been a very interesting and novel thought process. And so this is a table just showing you a number of these biologic medications have been tried more recently in um, clinical trials. Uh, what I'll highlight for you is a beta sept here. A beta sept in a smaller trial did show some encouraging results, and that's what has led to a larger um, multinational trial. And then I'll highlight for you the JAK inhibitors. The JAK inhibitors have specifically been tried in dermatomyositis. There's been some early evidence that the interferon pathway in dermatomyositis is particularly upregulated and JAK inhibitors may help suppress the interferon pathway and in turn help dermatomyositis patients. And so a small study was done with JAK inhibitors of nine patients here. It was open label, which means all patients got drug. But they did find that in some patients there was moderate improvement even after 12 weeks uh, of treatment. And so future studies may be planned with these JAK inhibitors. Uh, and then this table just shows you what clinical trials are actually ongoing currently, both in dermatomyositis and then in all myositis patients. Um, and so I think this is a, a time to sort of pause and for those of you that are out there and frustrated with the current immunotherapies that are out there, um, I'm very encouraged seeing a table like this, knowing that many scientists and myositis experts are out there trying to find better therapies for our patients and knowing that it's a huge unmet need, that steroids have significant side effects for so many patients, and it shouldn't be the only therapy that we have for our patients in 2020. Um, there's a lot of drug development going on out there and finding better agents that might select out a certain type of myositis or might target a certain pathway that will really help the immune system's pathway when it comes to dermatomyositis, myositis in general, or, or a certain subtype. And so um, I want to take a few minutes to highlight for you what's recently been done. I mean, these are trials that have either uh, been recently uh, revealed their results in the past year. Uh, and despite COVID in the past year, these trials have gone on. And so I think it's an encouraging time. And I want to leave you with optimism, knowing um, that there's so much work that's going on out there. Uh, but Octopharma did a IVIG trial specifically in dermatomyositis subtype. This was a large phase three trial uh, with 95 patients. And what they found was that 78.7% .7 of patients did respond to the therapy and showed improvement after 16 weeks of therapy. And so um, I've been encouraged by the study because uh, oftentimes insurances pose barriers in allowing medications such as IVIG, it's much more expensive than steroids. And getting positive results like this may allow us uh, to prescribe IVIG easier and get insurance approval easier for dermatomyositis. Uh, and these results were uh, revealed last year. Uh, a, a more recent trial was Xylucaplan. Xylucaplan is a drug designed by UCB. It's a complement inhibitor. The complement pathway is thought to have been activated in myositis, but in particular, 
This drug was looked at in the necrotizing myopathy subtype. This was a phase two study. And unfortunately, uh, results were really revealed a few months ago, and there was no meaningful effect. So uh, as of now, they are not moving forward in developing this drug in myositis. And then very recently, lenabisum, a drug developed by Corbis, uh, their phase two study showed some very encouraging results. So they did move on to a phase three study. This was a very large study of 175 patients. And unfortunately, their drug did not show improvement in the total improvement score when they measured it at 28 weeks. But uh, what they did see was that in a subset of patients that had active skin disease um, and no muscle involvement, there was actually improvement uh, in uh, these scores, in the skin measures. And so um, I think we'll see in months to come what the decision will be on if they can move forward with any aspect of treatment in dermatomyositis for this drug because it did seem to help the skin disease in dermatomyositis. Now, I mentioned earlier, Abetacep had done an earlier study where they showed some encouraging results. So they have completed a, a study, both in dermatomyositis and polymyositis patients. It was a much larger study, and we're still awaiting these results. We're anticipating these results in the upcoming year. And then lastly, I want to mention a study that is ongoing um, and has some promise in dermatomyositis and polymyositis, and that is the KZAR-616 drug. Um, this is a new drug. It's a first-in-class immunoproteosome inhibitor that's really designed to harmonize the immune system. And so it's thought to have immune modulatory effects rather than totally suppressing the immune system. This is a small molecule, KZAR-616, that has a selective mechanism, but has also been shown to inhibit the major drivers or causes of inflammation that we have seen in polymyositis and dermatomyositis affecting macrophages and T cells. And so it's thought that it might affect the function of many immune cells that are active in this pathway. Um, and hopefully suppressing them may really improve uh, both the muscle weakness and the rash that we see in myositis patients. Uh, this drug is being looked at in several autoimmune disorders. And there are some smaller studies that have been done showing good safety and tolerability. So this study is ongoing. It's a 32-week study where patients are either going to get drug or placebo. But what's nice about this study is it's called a crossover study. And then all patients will get crossed over to the patients that were on placebo will get drug and the patients that were on drug will get placebo. But then at the end of these 32 weeks, um, patients will get what we call open label drug and patients will be placed on drug for a long period and again be monitored. So I'm looking forward, uh, we are doing the study at UC Irvine and several sites are involved. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what this, the results of this drug will show in the years to come. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about inclusion body myositis because uh, unfortunately all of the treatments that I were talking about did not include inclusion body myositis, but there is encouraging work that is going on in inclusion body myositis. And um, as many of you know, we unfortunately do not have a drug treatment that helps IBM as of now. Um, and some of that has been because the cause of IBM has thought to be quite complex. You can see here 
this is a complex diagram where we think several factors are potentially interplaying with each other. And the question has still remained if this is a primary inflammatory process or if this is really a primary degenerative process and the inflammation happens as a secondary response to the degeneration that's happening in the muscle. And so this is really what's made it a challenge to identify what should be the target in treating IBM. Um, and as many of you know, many drugs, immunosuppressive drugs, have been tried since the 1990s. These are just a list of many of the immunosuppressive drugs that were tried in IBM. Unfortunately, all have failed to have a robust improvement in IBM. And so a lot of attention has shifted now to developing something newer. Um, and this is because there was even one study done that showed that immunosuppressive therapy may make IBM worse in the long run. So this was comparing IBM patients that have never seen immunosuppressive treatment and those patients that were placed or tried on immunosuppressive treatment. And what they noticed is that patients that were placed on immunosuppressive treatment had less independent mobility and used a wheelchair more often than patients that were never placed on it. And so in our practice and in many practices, we now never start steroids or other immune suppressive treatment for IBM patients because of the study we worry that did it even cause poorer prognosis in the long run. A lot of attention has been shifted to what can we do to help IBM. And so I'll take you through the story of some larger trials that have been done in IBM. Uh, one of these are the myostatin inhibitors. So this is a really cool um, thought process in that what we've learned that if you inhibit myostatin, you can actually regrow muscle. They discovered this in 1997 when Belgian blue cattle were born with the myostatin mutation and they noticed that they had huge muscles. And then in 2004, a German child was born with the myostatin mutation and they noticed he had huge muscle hypertrophy. This, is, this uh, garnered a lot of interest because many of you know that IBM patients have severe muscle atrophy. And so we thought, well, if we can inhibit myostatin in these patients, we may be able to grow back muscle and make them stronger. And so um, a study was done by Novartis uh, with a drug called bemagrumab. Bemagrumab uh, was a drug that inhibits myostatin. And so initially we tested 14 patients and we noticed that patients that got drug within eight weeks, they had expansion of their thigh muscle volume. So these muscles that were atrophied had regrown. And they also saw that patients could walk longer distances at six minutes in comparison to the placebo patients, especially 16 weeks later. This generated a lot of enthusiasm and uh, a large worldwide study was done. This was of 250 patients and um, they tested three different doses of the myostatin inhibitors and compared it to placebo. Um, 251 patients were involved in the study worldwide and unfortunately at 52 weeks they did not see any differences between patients who got drug or placebo when they tested their six-minute walk test. What they did see was that lean body mass did increase in these patients so we could regrow muscle 
But unfortunately, none of the strength measures or measures that could test their physical function were helpful. So uh, this meant that yes, this drug could regrow muscle and make the muscles larger, but they could not make the muscles stronger. And um, unfortunately, because of these results, Novartis decided to stop drug development with femogrumab in inclusion body myositis. Uh, now, attention then shifted to aramoclamol. That was probably the next largest study that was done in IBM. And aramoclamol is a drug that is thought to have several neuroprotective effects, protecting IBM patients from potentially degenerating muscles. And so a small study was published in 2013. This was with 24 patients. And they noticed giving them the drug was safe and to well tolerated. And patients may have a trend to a slower decline that's measured with a scale called the IBM functional rating scale. And maybe their grip strength did not decline as fast when they were on aramoclamol. So again, generating enthusiasm to do a larger study to reproduce potentially efficacy. And a large study was recently completed of 150 patients. Most of these sites were in the US. One site was in the London. We were a part of this study. And they looked at the rate of decline of muscle weakness, as well as many muscle strength testing, the six minute walk test. Uh, and unfortunately in March, just this past year, they announced results from the study. And again, it was a negative study. It did not show any benefit in slowing down disease progression in IBM or in any of the strength measures. Um, and so now attention has shifted, many of you know, with IBM to a drug called rapamycin or um, generic trade name, serolimus, you may hear. They're uh, similar names. The um, drug is thought to restore abnormal protein degradation. So we know that the protein in the muscle is degrading in IBM and can it hopefully restore protein degradation? Well, a small study was done in France. This was of 44 patients with very interesting results, actually. Uh, patients that were on rapamycin in blue in comparison to placebo, the chart on the left, what you'll see is uh, when they check them at six months and 12 months, patients that were on rapamycin could walk longer distances than patients that were on placebo. And then they also looked at muscle MRI. This is what I was talking about, how muscle MRI can give us insight in how damaged a muscle is. Well, what they noticed is that patients that were on rapamycin, this chart on the right, you can see that they had less muscle damage uh, than patients that were on placebo. The patients that were on placebo had more fatty replacement. So this small study of 44 patients done in France generated a lot of enthusiasm in saying, we should look at this further. And a large study uh, is being planned. Um, this professor, Professor Needham, who's based in Australia, did receive a large grant of $1.8 million to do the study. And so because of the grant, seven sites are going to be funded in Australia. There are two sites that are planned in the US. That's gonna be at University of Kansas and Hopkins. And five sites are being planned in Europe. This study is anticipated to start later this year. Um, and so we're going to have to look out for these results. But in the meantime, there are some uh, drugs that are being thought of 
Uh, these are smaller scale studies, more in the preclinical phases. Um, Pioglitazone is a drug that's being tested at Hopkins with 15 patients. It's a very small study. We're waiting to hear results on this. And then our site at UC Irvine is thinking about a drug called dilazotine, um, as well as a drug to develop. Uh, we're working in collaboration with Dr. Greenberg from Harvard, um, a drug to target KLRG1. KLRG1 is the cell population that we have found that's been expressed on T cells in IBM patients' muscle and in blood. And these are unpublished results, but what we've found is that these cells may be seen throughout the disease, just, um, both in earlier years as well as later years of IBM patients, and despite disease severity. And so we're thinking and trying to find a way to target the cell line as we think it may be beneficial to IBM patients. So you may hear about this in years to come. And so I, I, I really just want the IBM patients to know that we are as a community thinking about what we can do better. If there's drugs that we can start combining to make the muscle larger and stronger, um, if we can find measures that can detect a change sooner so we can develop drugs faster in IBM. And um, I'm going to end with this slide uh, talking about how for all myositis patients, uh, multidisciplinary care is very important. So if you go to a myositis clinic at a university, many of us believe that we should have a physical therapist, a speech therapist, a respiratory therapist present to help um, the different systems that may be involved and um, evaluate adaptive equipment to try to prevent the fall risks that are present in myositis. And I can't score enough the importance of the role of exercise we have now seen in all types of myositis that exercise, especially aerobic training, may be very helpful in helping slow progression and treating those patients and help strengthening them. And so I'll just end with, um, we do believe that there are therapies out there for our patients. Uh, dermatomyositis, inclusion, body myositis, we're looking for therapies. If there haven't been responses to patients with polymyositis, dermatomyositis, necrotizing myopathy, ask your physician for a blood test with the antibody testing because knowing your subtype may help. Um, and if conventional standard therapies don't help, uh, ask about the clinical trials that are out there if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, the website, you can actually look up the current trials that are out there that are active and enrolling patients. And um, optimal care really does involve a team of specialists. Um, ask for these teams if your clinics don't have them. Ask to see a physical therapist, a respiratory therapist if you have breathing difficulty. And um, I think this should help empower getting better control of your disease. And so with that, I'm gonna thank everyone and um, pause there for questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Goyal, for your very informative presentation. I'm gonna go back and your very beautiful picture of your clinic, very jealous. <laughs> that you get to see that every day. I like to tell people it's a view from my office, but it's about five, 10 metal, uh, <laughs> miles from the university setting. So I used to practice in Boston and had very snowy days. So this is, you know, a wonderful change for me. Absolutely, yeah. 
If any attendees have any questions, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you can use the Q&A bubble, click in the bubble and type in your question. We already have a few that have come in, so I will get straight to it. Um, one question asks, do all these new drugs have similar side effects as Cellcept? Oh, that's such a great question. I can give just an hour talk on optimal medications. And so um, given the constraints of the time and wanting to cover a broad topic, I didn't uh, cover side effects. But that is such a great uh, question because all the medications really do have a different side effect profile. And so if you can't tolerate a medication, don't be afraid of asking your physician if there is another medication. Uh, mycophenolate can sometimes have some nausea, um, stomach upset, diarrhea, and some patients may tolerate it just great. Just because you have side effects with one medication does not mean that you'll have side effects or the same side effects with another medication. So um, don't be shy about asking your physician uh, if there is another drug you can switch to. Other options include methotrexate, azathioprine, IVIG tends to have less side effects. Um, and then there's newer agents out there, like I was mentioning in clinical trials. And so um, if you can't tolerate those medications, uh, be an advocate. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to the myositis experts. Um, that's why we have the Myositis Medical Advisory Board, even on the Myositis Association, because we try to make ourselves available to answer questions for patients that um, have difficult journeys with medications. Thank you. We have a few comments. I think this was referring to the clinical trial in Paris. Someone said that they just enrolled a patient. Um, so I'm not sure if that was literal or if they want to go to Paris and do <laughs> a clinical trial. So, so that trial was completed in Paris and then um, they may be referring to the rapamycin serolimus trial that's now um, started in Australia, I hope. Um, and I know that um, the U.S. will have two sites, Kansas and Hopkins. And so um, it is supposed to be starting. I was hedging with when, uh, if it's starting now or if it's going to be starting fall. But we're excited about that trial. And um, for those of you, I know in the U.S. there's not many sites. We wanted to be a part of that trial. Um, but sometimes trials are even just designed based on funding that they get. And I think because of the huge grant that Australia got, that's why there's more sites in Australia. Um, but oftentimes, if they see encouraging results, there may be a grant that comes about in the future where more sites can be enrolled and we can get more patients in the U.S. too. Yeah, and it looks like he was referring to Australia, so oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> another question, or another comment that has come in um, just says, mental health is also a huge part of living with myositis. And I know at many care centers, they have social workers and um, staff that can help. Absolutely, I, I actually um, tell a lot of patients, and thank you for that comment, because that is so important. Um, mental health, health is important. Um, it's hard to have a positive attitude when you're dealing with such a disabling condition. Sometimes that can be quite encompassing, that can be quite uh, multi-systemic. So tapping into a social worker, tapping into, um, if it's a medication that may be needed, support groups, um, these are all very helpful resources. The MDA, the Myositis yes. Association, these are all groups that we all have the same mission. Absolutely. And just to plug in another MDA Engage webinar that has happened this year is one on psychosocial support with a chronic illness. So uh, where you registered for this webinar, there is one on our on-demand section 
uh, that deals with mental health when you have uh, a diagnosis of a neuromuscular disease and just tips and tricks on how, you know, to get through it. <laughs> Another um, question that has come in, I know we're running low on time, is what's your take on Zeljans? I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, if you heard the part of the talk where I was talking about the investigational agents, that Zeljans um, falls under the category of the JAK inhibitors. And um, there have been some very encouraging results about a JAK inhibitors helping dermatomyositis patients. Um, and so I think it's important to um, follow closely with your clinician. We're learning more about this drug. The preclinical data where we've looked at the mechanism that it might be helping, that's why I was talking about knowing your subtype might actually be help help helpful. And I can't stress that enough because we're now starting to think well, maybe a drug such as Zelgens will be helpful in dermatomyositis, but maybe it's not going to be helpful in necrotizing myositis, or if you still want to use the broad category of polymyositis. And so um, knowing that subtype uh, will be helpful. I think we'll learn more about Zelgens in the months to come. Thank you. Another question that has come in is, how do we address pain with our doctors who don't believe pain is real with this? Oh, that's such a good question. And it actually breaks my heart. We um, did a small study because we just kept hearing about pain. And uh, pain is a phenomenon. And I think myositis experts do recognize that uh, pain is, and sometimes, unfortunately, uh, as patients, I know you guys have to educate your neurologists, your rheumatologists, and um, we are recognizing that pain happens in the muscles, it happens in the joints. Uh, so asking if you need help with a pain medication, because sometimes immunosuppressive agents won't help all of it. So uh, some things to help pain. Pain is better control of the disease. Um, needing a pain medication, even if it's a neuropathic pain medication like gabapentin can help. And then getting physical therapy can help with range of motion, can help the pain component. Aerobic training, stationary cycling. In the pandemic, I told a lot of my patients to go on Amazon, and this isn't an Amazon commercial, but buying stationary pedals, they're like 20 bucks. You don't need the full cycle, but stationary cycling can help um, address pain. Just a few final comments before I conclude. You are getting some shout outs from uh, the Myositis Support and Understanding Association. They said great webinar and excellent updates. Um, a healthcare consultant and rare disease advocate based in NYC says, uh, Informative webinar, such useful info to share with other medical professionals. Uh, Thank you. And another comment from an attendee says, just to let you know, did two years of Rituxin 17 yesterday, 17 years ago, and it worked. Drug-free for 17 years. CPK was 6,800 and normal now. Washington University, Dr. Pest Trunk is amazing. Absolutely, totally agree. Um, and I love that last comment because I want all the attendees to know that when a drug doesn't work, please ask your myositis expert about another drug because um, we don't have a cookbook way of doing this. When one drug doesn't work, another may work. I've also had great experiences with Rituxan and um, helped some patients go into remission even. I'm going to share my screen one more time just so I could conclude the presentation. I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Goyal, for being our guest presenter. 
today. We appreciate your time and expertise and everything you do for the neuromuscular community. So thank you so much. Do you have any last words for our audience? Oh, thank you so much for having me. I um, hope this gives you some insight. I just want you to know that there are so many advancements, both from a diagnostic perspective, as well as the medications, clinical trials that are out there. And so we can do better and we will do better for all of us in the myositis world. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. We would love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, open your camera and point it at the QR code on the screen. A web page will pop up with a short survey on today's webinar. If you do not have a smartphone, once the webinar is over, a screen will pop up with the survey as well. Also, thank you again to our event sponsor, Kizar Life Sciences. We would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support, so thank you very much. If anyone has any questions after this webinar, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow back up with you. If you are new to MDA through this program and are diagnosed with one of our over 43 diseases under MDA's umbrella or are a loved one of someone who is diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with MDA. You can do this by visiting mda.org slash join and completing a short form. This concludes today's MDA Engage webinar, polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Dr. Goyal, and have a great rest of your day.